All right, guys, I'm Andy with Northwoods TCG, and today we're going to be talking about three things that new Pokemon investing channels talk about that really don't make a lot of sense and gets confusing. So we're going to cover that right after this. Alright everybody, I'm Andy with Northwood CCG. Today, we're going to be sitting down and talking about three things that new Pokemon investors say on their channels that don't necessarily make sense. Now, there are a new influx. There's a really good influx of new individuals coming into the hobby right now that are actually bringing good information. And I'm not saying that there's bad information with all of them. And I do enjoy seeing some new faces, some new ideas, some new directions. All of these things can be very good for the hobby and good for you if you're trying to figure out what your direction is, Pokemon TCG. Sometimes as you get older into the hobby, you sometimes get some biases. You start getting a little jaded to some things and you don't necessarily look at them any longer just because it's just not safe to you or you had a bad experience with it. But that's not necessarily a bad thing in, gen in the long term that these may actually have some really good value. It's just not my cup of tea. And that's a good opportunity for someone new to jump into the hobby, take a spot in YouTube and be able to take that space to be actually able to give you better information than what I am in those particular areas. So I'm not really talking down to them, but I do hear a lot of things that come up quite a bit. And I always find it very interesting that these comments are made and they really do give a good opportunity to have a good discussion about them and how to actually, how it actually works. Let's actually talk about how this would work this way and then also how it doesn't work that way. And that way you can see where we actually get to at a certain point after so many years of doing this, you can tell these people are relatively new. They maybe had a large sum of money. They bought a bunch of stuff during the hype. Maybe they've come in the last year and decided that they've had some success, so now they're going to share it with you. Whatever has come about of this, there are definitely some different opportunities in this, but I definitely want to cover this a little bit, just talking about some of the pros and cons of each one of these things that I continually hear with newer Pokemon investing channels. There's always someone to be coming. There's going to be us old dogs. There's going to be new dogs, and I'm glad to see them, but today we're going to be covering that a little bit. Also in these videos... I'm going to be doing a little bit fewer videos. I want to try and get it down to maybe one solid video a week, or if I can, I'll get two. But what I really want to do is stop doing off-the-shelf content. I want to just start doing some really good in-depth videos like this, do a little bit better quality on the editing, take my time, make it look good, actually put in the edits that I want to do, and actually give you a really well-put-together take rather than something that I'm just trying to whip out to try and get quality quantity over quality. Once again, sometimes a little bit better quality will do a lot better than something that you're just trying to put together and you're looking at information. Yes, the information's right. The stuff you're putting out there is correct, but it's just really done really quickly and it looks like that way. So that's one of the things that I want to be changing. So what I want to talk about first is going to be a very simple thing. And I'm going to look down at my notes. I'm going to use notes to make sure I get everything right. But today, the first thing I want to talk about when it comes down to things that I continually hear from new Pokemon investing channels that I really don't just that I really don't agree with any longer is going to be buying only at the lowest points. Now, this is something I hear time and time again. That if you sit there and you actually take your time and you just wait for these things to fall, Julian. then you're gonna have the opportunity to be able to buy them and have great investments. Well. Personally, I don't have a crystal ball. No, 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 no. Do you guys have a crystal ball? I do not. So without me having a crystal ball, I don't know what the low point is. Only thing you can do is really do guesstimates, and you can really, really investigate to where you think the low point of these particular items are. That doesn't mean it's it. It means that it's a guess. So you're going to be purchasing all the way around that particular point. Some people are going to hit it or be close. Some people are going to be way off. And if you really are just focusing on hitting that very bottom point, you may never buy anything. You may never buy anything with that thought process. There are many reasons on why we don't try and actually hit the very bottom point. Because if you're literally sitting there waiting for it, let's be honest, guys. Me, myself, as I am, I don't have like a whole wall full of screens with every single Pokemon product that I'm interested in and purchase watching like a stock ticker to see when the pricing is changing, when it's heading for that bottom point, and when that's going to happen. The other factor is too is you could never predict what the Pokemon TCG itself is going to do. How many reprints are they going to do? Are they going to slam ETBs? Are they going to slam booster boxes? Are they going to send out checkline blisters? Are they going to send out the cardboard sleeve blisters? 
we don't know, right? So as the time goes on, and what Pokemon does itself can also really, really influence how these particular items go. So trying to guess that exact low point on a buy-in buy on in any particular product is extremely difficult, if not impossible. So once again, it's really difficult to do so. So what's the workaround, and how does an experienced investor work around this particular problem? I buy all the way down to the bottom. So what I mean by that is, is that I have a baseline in my head. I think anybody that does investing and works with products and works with information and actually sits there and looks at the data can kind of get a well felt out point for where a lot of these points are, where a product should go to. So for example, a booster box. I know if a booster box is released that it's going to drop a certain percentage all the way down to, let's just say a Scarlet and Violet booster box all the way down under $90. Typically right now, every booster box in the Scarlet and Violet era has continually dropped until it's gone under $90. Every one of them. There hasn't been a single one that saved from that. Paradox Rift even came close to saving itself, but it was still $88 at one point on TCG Player. So overall, it still happens to most of the booster boxes or every booster box so far in the Scarlet and Violet era. So to me, that's a baseline set. Now I have a baseline point where I can sit there and look at these particular sets and go, Okay, I know it's going to start dropping. I know it's going to start going down. And know it's going to go from 115 to 125 on release, and it's going to continually fall until it gets down around that $90 range. So what do I do as an investor? Well, I'll start buying at $90. Why not? It may not go far below 90 It may hit 90 and go straight back up. We may, like it did with Paradox Drift, it hit 88 and it bounced right off of 88 You literally had like a day to buy it at that low point, and if you would have missed that day, you would never get it at that low point again. It may never go to that low point. And we may not get a reprint of Paradox Rift. If we do, is it going to be big enough to cause these things to actually occur and drop down below that price? These are all things we don't know. And we won't know until we get to that point in time. So this is an opportunity where we can look at that and say, okay, I'm going to buy at 91, 90, 98, or 89, 88, 87. Okay, it hit. I'm going to continue buying. Now it's up to 88. I'm going to go 89. I'm going to go 90. I'm going to go 91. And I'm going to keep buying all the way up through that little trough. So you're going to go down and through the trough and actually purchase through that. Why? What are we doing in that scenario? Well, number one, you're making it so you don't necessarily miss that low point. But number two, it means that you don't necessarily have to hit it dead on because the odds of doing that are extremely low. And if it comes out and it gets reprinted, and let's just say hypothetically it goes down to $80. Okay, you're watching it, and it starts dropping below that 88 again. Okay, now it's down to 85. I'm going to buy at 85, 84, 83, 82. It hits 80, and then I come back up again. What am I doing? If anybody out there knows, let me know in the comments below. What am I doing in this scenario before I actually say it? And I'll give you a minute. One minute later. All right, time's up. So what you're actually doing is what we call cost dollar averaging. We do this in stocks. We do this in a lot of other op opportunities is that you actually cost dollar average into that low point. When you see something dropping, you continually continue to buy into that particular item. And that way you actually do try and hit that low point, but you're not trying to just buy only at that low point. So when you average them products out, it ends up being in a really tight range right there. And what that actually gives you is the opportunity to be able to have some really good growth and actually have some little securities that you're not going to miss that low point and you're going to get it where you want to in that range. So there's always those opportunities that we work at when it comes down to that cost dollar averaging. That is something, a technique that you'll learn as you get longer into this hobby. And you can do this with individual booster boxes. Some people do it with cases. It just depends on your load. It just depends on how much money you want to put into your investments in Pokemon. For me personally, I typically do it with, you know, cases or individuals. It just depends on what my ultimate goal is with this particular product. If I feel really, really good about it, I'll buy a case. And if I feel like it could continue to drop down even lower, I'll just buy individual booster boxes. And if it sits at a low point, I'll buy a case at that point. Because that's where I feel secure that it's hit a floor. Now, what's the other thing you can do? Let's say you messed up. As an investment in Pokemon, you, you may mess up, right? People did it with the hype and the FOMO during 2021. They would buy Battle Styles. I personally know people that bought Battle Styles booster boxes at $178 a box. That's right, $178 a box. I am never going to financially recover from this. Now, if you did that, and if you do that in the future with any of the Pokemon booster boxes or products, works with all products, you buy it at that high point, what do you do? You continually let it go down, and you buy as it goes to the low point. So Battle Styles is a perfect example where you had time, 
and you could have bought more of these booster boxes at $75. This is where cost, cost dollar averaging really can give you an advantage, and it kind of eats away that loss. So if you've got, you know, let's say five booster boxes or a case, let's just say you get six booster boxes you bought at $175. If you go and buy them at $75 and you buy four cases at that price, you draw down the overall amount that you spent for all those booster boxes and average it out, you can really shrink down that price. So you don't need to make $175 a booster box. Now you got to make $100 a booster box. And that's how you cost dollar average out of these problems. And if you would have done that and you could have done that for that particular way of doing it, you could have done it. You would have been able to sell out of those booster boxes with a profit here just recently in the Pokemon TCG. So those opportunities do come and there is ways to get out of them. It's just a matter of, once again, throwing money at it sometimes. And it really sucks to have to do that, but that's just sometimes how it works. So now we're going to move into the second item I got on my list, which is going to be market is easily being manipulated. So this is a very interesting one I hear, and I do agree with this in some points. There are specific cards, there are specific items that can be manipulated by individuals in the Pokemon TCG. Sometimes on set releases, we will see alternate arts jack up in price extremely high and then just continue to fall. People are price manipulating. They're buying all of them up that they can, and they really drive the prices up of those alternate arts. Now, the funny thing is about that is, is that by cost-wise, it's really not going to work in your favor for very long. You could buy a bunch of them at the lower price, jack them up to the high price, you could sell out, and then the market's going to fall back down. Problem is, is that everybody that gets sucked into the vortex with you is going to pay that high price, they're going to spin up it and then just fall out the bottom when you find when everybody sells out at that higher price. These people that are following the trail up. What I've seen in the market recently is that that isn't as easy to do any longer. People have a better mental mental lock on where things are supposed to be priced based on the release, based on previous experiences. All these things play into a factor. Last time I really saw this really occur was with the uh, Machamp. That was one of them that we actually speculated had happened because the pull rate was really low on the first release of Astral Radiance, and they were gone off a of TCG player, and the price just went straight up to like $160 right at release. So it went from being like a $40 to $50 card on release all the way up to $160, and then all of a sudden we saw it all drop back down to $90. So we saw that correction right away. Our speculation was that someone might have manipulated that or a group of individuals manipulated that and caused it. Now... Is that happening all the time in the Pokemon TCG? Absolutely not. There just isn't enough money volume that people are putting into trying to do these things, and there really isn't a good reason to do it. There are places in the world where you can price manipulate, but the problem is, is that Pokemon Center has always got the availability to kill that, and that's a big factor when it comes down to like booster boxes and sealed product, especially products that are still in rotation. It's really hard to price manipulate those, because if they do draw everything out of the, pro out of the market, and players want it, people want it, Pokemon will do a massive reprint and completely kill them anyway. So they're not going to put themselves at that risk a lot. So it's just something to consider. They don't want to be destroyed by these particular products happening and getting flushed out with more product. So once again, just something to consider when it comes down to what you're looking at in the Pokemon TCG. These things can occur. They're not impossible. I'm not going to say they're not. But in general, it's not very likely. I don't have enough money to manipulate that much, and most people don't. So once again, a lot of it's just normal market fluctuations. Even Evolving Skies, do I think that there's a lot of people holding on to the booster boxes of Evolving Skies for investments? Absolutely. This set has been toted as the GOAT of the Pokemon TCG since 2021, 2022. It has been continually doing this, and it's been toted this way, and it's going to, it's going to be acting like that, and the people are going to be manipulating it. Do I think that there's a lot of booster boxes out there that people don't even think about? Yes, I think there's thousands of booster boxes. This is going to be the next XY Evolutions here in a few years where they're just going to continually just keep coming and coming and coming. They're just going to keep coming back because the market's going to go up and people are going to slowly release them back into the market. They'll never truly disappear off of the sales sites, but there will always be a high price on them because people, I believe, have enough smarts to hold on to them and continue to drive them. Now, since there's no price manipulation... What are we actually seeing when it comes down to these markets? A lot of times we're seeing good market growth. Pokemon sometimes doesn't equate for the success of particular sets. How well are they going to perform? How playable are they? Are the player base going to use these cards? And they can underestimate a lot of times what's going on in these particular markets. And that's why we do see these big influxes and increases in the pricing of certain products, cards, all these things. Even Evolving Skies, another 
go back to the example. For the amount that was bought off the primary market and disappeared even off the secondary market, and for the excitement about that, Pokemon may have missed an opportunity there to make more money. And that's exactly what could occur. They moved on. They didn't think that it was going to be. It was going out of rotation and coming out of the rotation or last year rotation. And they just decided not to reprint it, which they do quite a bit. They usually reprint for the first two years. After that, they really don't do very many reprints. You won't see very many reprints of a set in the last year of rotation. Typically, there's new sets, stronger sets, more playable sets. Fusion Strike was actually a stronger set. Brilliant Stars is a stronger set. Even, um, even Silver Tempest is a stronger set than actually Evolving Skies ever was when it came down to competitive play. The Moon Brion, which is a big hype card, is the only reason that drives forward. So Pokemon could have reprinted that, taken advantage of that market, but they didn't. And that's a lot of times what we see when it comes down to why pricing is going up so fast and why overall there isn't a lot of particular of these booster boxes out there. It's just because the secondary market's climbing on it. And what is happening is Pokemon International has no interest in reprinting them. Once again, you got to think about it. When it comes down to Pokemon investing, a lot of our stuff is coming down to the actual Pokemon TCG and Pokemon International on how they're reprinting and how they're planning on managing the actual release of these products. So they control a lot of it. How much they send it out really does affect that overall market. Going into the third one. The third one I always find to be a very interesting one that we discuss and talk about, and we actually hear quite a mixed bag on this one of what you want to do and i'm going to tell you exactly what i feel right now do what you want do what's comfortable for you that's right volume people talk about this back and forth is it better to buy a hundred of something or is it better to buy one of something is it better to buy one of a hundred things or is it better to buy a hundred of one things and there is a lot of mixed feelings when it comes down to this particular subject Personally, I do what I want. I will never say, and you'll see it on my channel, I don't go buy 100 booster boxes of a particular product, and I don't necessarily just buy one. I find what's comfortable, and there's a bad side to each version of this. So if you buy, let's just say you go to Sword and Shield. I'm going to use Sword and Shield as an, an example again. And you would have bought one of every single booster box through Sword and Shield. Overall, you wouldn't be doing as hot as you would think you would be. Evolving Skies is really driving your portfolio in the Sword and Shield era. You go back to even the first sets. You go back to Sword and Shield Base. You go back to Rebel Clash. You go to Darkness of Blaze and Vivid Voltage, all of which are still sitting right around MSRP. Yes, Sword and Shield Base set is way up there, about $230, but it really hasn't had any movement for the last year. Rebels Clash, once again, another one that's sitting right around $200, just because of lack of print on those two sets. But the other sets are all sitting right around, you know, right around MSRP. They're around $144 to $180 currently through the Sword and Shield era. Falling Skies, your only oddball set, sitting up there at about $680. Now, when it came down to myself, did I buy a ton or buy one of every single set? Yes, I bought one case of every single set except for the first ones because I had sold all of them out during the boom and I never went back to get them. I really don't have enough interest in the Sword and Shield base set. Rebel Clash and Darkness of Blaze and Vivid Voltage to really go and, and buy a, another case of them. There just isn't the interest in there for me to do so. I do have some Vivid Voltage. I, I have two cases of Vivid Voltage just because I think that Chunk of Choose is still going to be a chase of the future for our kids. But a lot of my money went to the alternate art eras of, these, of Sword and Shield. Now, look at it this way. When I bought Evolving Skies, I went out of the norm. I bought 10 cases of Evolving Skies. Why? Because I did my research on that particular set, and I knew that that set was goaded between the Rayquaza, the Dragonite, all the evolutions, everything that's available in that set just was a fantastic set, and I knew it. So I bought more of that one, and that's where I talk about. Sometimes volume is good. Volume is good if you can pick the right particular set, and it's all up to you. You do what you're comfortable with, because if you're good at picking out good Pokemon sets, and historically you know what people are going to want and why it's going to be that good and you're comfortable with doing that, then yes, go ahead, buy in. Buy as much as you want of that particular set and you'll probably do great. You can get that volume, buy a large volume of it, hold it and really get them benefits. But if you're not comfortable with doing that, you can spread it across all of Sword and Shield and you still would be up from the lows. If you would have bought them at that lower points, if you would have watched it and bought them on the low 10% of those particular sets, you could still have some really good value. So you could buy all, and the same thing that I'm talking about even in Scarlet and Violet. I'm saying go buy 
one booster box of every set. Why not? One of them will take off and it'll do really well. That'll really drive your portfolio forward. That way you're putting all your, your eggs in every basket rather than trying to put them all in one. That's just me. If you're not comfortable with really assessing sets and really, really, really diving in on one, then I would definitely go ahead and spread it out. Go ahead and spread it out through where you see popularity. Even if you were to go through all the alternate art sets of Sword and Shield, I think you'd be doing just fine. And these are all decisions that you need to make. So when it comes down to these new YouTubers talking about volume, buy cases, you know, buy truckloads, buy all these promos or all these cards because they're going to be your best opportunity. Or you hear another one say, don't buy volume, only buy one, stay really small and only buy a couple. It's really up to you and it's your discretion at the end of the day. Personally, I do both. I buy some, I just buy because, well, I want one case of it just in case something happens and it does extremely well. I don't want to miss the boat and not have any of it available. But on the other hand, I will double down, triple, quadruple down on sets that I think will be do that will be very good in the future. Example, I got Chilling Rain. I got five cases of Chilling Rain. At $80 a booster box, I couldn't go wrong with purchasing that particular set. Same thing with Evolving Skies. Bought 10 cases of that particular set because I thought it was goaded to no end. Also have Lost Origins and Brilliant Stars. I have four cases of each of those. All of which I think are going to do really well and be good investments futuristically. But once again, that's just because I know how to analyze sets. And I was hoping that these ones, based on what they had in them, would be very, very strong sets. So, once again, consider that. Think about it. Make sure that you're understanding that and that volume is not, def not always the number one end-all, be-all way of doing things. And neither is buying low volume. They're both good in their own aspects. And it's all up to you as a person for where you want to do that and where you want to take advantage of that. What opportunities you want to spend. Do you have the capital to do that? If you don't have the capital, buying one is just as good as buying 100 and going into debt to get 100 of them. If you can afford to buy one with no debt, put it on the shelf, do it. That's definitely the options and the opportunities that you should be looking at. So once again, guys, let me know in the videos in the comments below, how do you feel about this video now that I've kind of changed them up? This is going to be more of an in-depth, like I said, it's a little bit longer video, I know that, but I want to be able to have these good discussions, these in-depth, do a little bit better editing, clean these up, and actually be able to discuss things without worrying about, did I say something wrong, is it going to change tomorrow, and let, doing less of these off-the-shelf type of conversations and doing more of these in-depth conversations, better editing, and cleaner for you guys to understand. So, once again, thank you everybody that's uh, been joining in today. Hopefully this is a good video. Let me know in the comments below what you think, or should I just do rapid-fire videos? With that being said, check out the two videos at the end. I will put them up for your information afterwards, and we'll see you next time here on Northwoods TCG.